I know you recognize this handsome brute because you see him every, almost every night here on Ted 11 Strong in Barney Miller. This is Max Gale, and he's now, of course, appearing in Whiz Kids. But he's Wojo on Barney Miller, and we've just moved Barney Miller to 10.30 at night. Oh, it's a very right. good show, Max. Yeah, I feel you, that way. And you were on the show for eight years. Uh -huh. You did it eight years. I hope you're getting big residuals. Well, you know, the residuals uh, go down each time they show, and the show has played so many times that actually they're not, they're not uh, big residuals. But that's all right. I have the... Uh, the pleasure of having been a part of something that I, that you're I proud feel of. proud of and people enjoy it and that's it, worth more than money. Oh, is it? Is it pride? Mm -hmm. Pride in one in what one has done. But isn't it strange that, that uh, a show as fine as Barney Miller gets an audience later? I mean, that, that many years later down the road. Uh, you mean as, as a rerun audience, yeah. you mean? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I don't think it's so strange. To be honest with you, I think it's kind of a natural phenomenon. If something, if something is has merit, you know, we do still do Shakespeare, yeah. five hundred years later. Yeah. So I think when when anything taps into that universal sense of what of what theater is about, uh, then it has it has meaning. Anytime you see it. Well, Barney Miller has held up very, very well. Right. Now, let's talk about Quiz Kids. Okay, right. You replaced the guy who was playing the, uh, the young, the liaison between the young people on the Quiz mm -hmm. Kids and, you, and I yourself. I think that uh, there was an actor, Michael Horton, who did mm -hmm. the pilot. And I think it would be more fair to say that the network asked to have a, an older person uh, relate with the kids, you know, that they felt that maybe Michael was a little too close in age for the kind of uh -huh. uh, spec uh, spectrum they wanted the show to cover, and that would be more fair to Michael because he did an excellent job of of uh, how the character was his character was written in the pilot. Richie, you got a lot going on today. I got a murder, I got a fire, I got a possibly corrupt state assemblyman, and I got an escaped hippo at the zoo. Right, you've got a murder and a fire, and possibly corrupt state assemblyman, an escaped hippo from the zoo, and now a missing data processing manager to deal with. Why don't you write Ralph a bloodhound program? You can put a leash on him and he can sniff these guys out for you. Very funny. Maybe you'd like me to access your files here at the newspaper. I could rewrite some of your stories. You'd have an escaped state assemblyman and a possibly corrupt hippo. <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. Would you? <laughs> no. Okay. This guy hired you to test the security system for the company he works for, and you broke into the system. And now you think he's disappeared. Maybe he got fired. Did you think of that? <laughs> Why would they say he's on a business trip, then? That's a good question. Next. He's got a portable computer. He can log on to his company's computer from anywhere in the world with it and get messages. Mm -hmm. Why are they writing everything through this Riker guy? That's another good question. And then there's this. Now, why, if he's out of town, he doesn't have a terminal with him, is he sending this Carl guy messages like this? All right, that's three good questions. So now I got one for you. With missing persons, even the police won't do anything for 48 hours. So what do you expect me to do? You could call Quinn. I don't know. Get a search warrant, check his apartment, check his office at the factory, anything. Richie, if it's real important to you, I'll call Quinn. But he isn't gonna do anything, believe me. Not even for you? I thought you were friends. Just because a guy marries your sister doesn't make him your friend. Okay. Thanks, anyway. How do you react to the critics who say things about you that might not be all that swell? Well, I'll give you a very good example. I'll give you a very good example, okay? I want you to take this, Max, and read this little part that I've outlined <coughs> right there. Read it aloud. Farley, played by Max Gale, who looks and sounds like a C.D. or Jack Nicholson. Well, I was <laughs> delighted with that because I really felt that the pilot that they showed me, uh, the one you just described, was a, I used the expression white bread, you know, that it was a kind of blanched out uh, TV view of the world where uh, all the sidewalks had curbs and everybody was happy and wealthy and successful and there was none of the grit that real life is about. And I said that, the, um, that I would be interested in it. I described a character that, would be like a holdout for the 60s and um, into aspects of, of real life that I don't feel like we've quite tapped it yet in the, in, the, in the work we've done, but 
But that kind of describes it, a certain seediness, you know, and you don't they're always trying clothes. to get me to remind me to comb my hair and stuff like that. And no, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, remember, this is TV Guide. I mean, I'm not putting Consider it, I'm not source, putting it huh? down, but I mean, we're, TV uh, has basically uh, blanched out so much that now the most successful shows on the air right now are all the bloopers. Yeah. You know, people want to see the, the real stuff. And so in that sense, you know, people that aren't perfect and their teeth aren't all right, I mean, in that sense, if that's what's meant by uh, CD, and I think Jack Nicholson is, uh, to be compared is with a great him, artist. <laughs> Have you, you know, seen so his Terms of Endearment yes, by any, any yes. chance? That was shot right in Lincoln, Nebraska, and we're yeah. very, very proud of it. It's a beautiful movie directed by Jimmy Brooks, who directed it and wrote it, and Jimmy was responsible for Mary Tyler Moore, and he's, he got his training in TV. And I think what really thrills me about it all is that the most popular money-making movie out right now is a very human movie about relationships. And uh, that's something to point to each time. Say, well, they only want action, or they only want this, or they only want yeah. that. And they point to that movie, and it, it reaches everybody. Or they only want the movies for the four age 14 to 24-year-old mm -hmm. group. Mm -hmm. The last time I saw a film where I saw older people actually lined up was on Golden Pond. Uh -huh. And it was so nice to tap that source out there, because mm -hmm. there are people out there who still want to go to the movies, but we don't need all the and, action and all the time. Yeah, and, and um, movies, uh, theater, is all. Well, the intent of it was to get the community together and allow the whole circle of the community to see itself. And I feel that it's really a shame. Uh, I was recently in a movie, DC Cab, that has some good yucks in it and mm -hmm. a lot of fun. And I would recommend it because I think that there's a, there's a heart in the way a lot of, uh, you might call it an eclectic cast of <laughs> comedians eclectic and weightlifters and you know, actors and stuff came together. And we all came out of it with, a kind of a, with an affection and respect for each other. But basically, uh, in the making of the movie, they s kept zeroing in on, you know, money, 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 where's the audience, and thinking yeah. it through in that way. And I think they missed a lot of opportunities within it to make a film that would have drawn a lot of people to it. You know, people, particularly people, you know, from the suburbs and so on, who supposedly wouldn't like this kind of ghettoized movie, and let people understand each other more. And uh, so that Terms of Endearment, didn't concern itself with any of that kind of external, how can we make money off of it? And I'm real glad to see them making a big success mm -hmm. out of it. It just made me feel proud to be an actor to see those people do that. Well, look for him in DC Cab because it's playing right now in the theaters in Nebraska. And of course, we're tearing <laughs> Barney Miller and the Wiz kids. But I just love, I love your color scheme, Max. Do you know that Lincoln, I believe Lincoln, Nebraska is where they had the trial for Standing Bear? Yes. Yeah. So it was in Lincoln, Nebraska, that the courts decided that Indians were not part of the wildlife, but actually were people. You're very involved with the Indians. Why? I've always been curious about it, and I've had the good fortune to meet a lot of Indian people and, and travel around the country and, and see uh, that that's not something to only be seen as a plight or, or only be seen as something in the past, but is really a wellspring of the American spirit. And... Uh, you know, well, you know this because you're from there. You know, p people on the coast tend to think that everything that's hip and, and intelligent is on the coast, and everybody out there in the Midwest doesn't really know what's going on. But mm -hmm. I'm from the Midwest, and mm -hmm. I know that it's really kind of the opposite, you know. Yeah. Well, Marlon um, Brando came to Lincoln not too long ago, uh -huh. and uh, he wanted to give back to the Indians all the land from the uh, Black Hills to the Mississippi. Uh -huh. The problem is that my house was there. Yeah. <laughs> I said, yeah. wait a minute, Marlon. Wait, wait a minute. Now, wait just a minute here. <laughs> Move a little slowly, please. Yeah. Well, I think that we all, what we need to do is just, you know, I, I don't think, I think that's easy to get confused on it. Indian people don't really want to, I'm uh, speaking a uh, generalization like this, of course, but yeah. I think the basic thrust is not a matter of who owns the land, because the basic Indian philosophy of life was that no one owns the land. It's really a matter of having the right attitude toward the land and understanding what's, what it is as a community property. And I think that's something that everybody's starting to grasp because what we've allowed to happen is for, for terrible things to happen to the water supply and the land in such a way that really, you know, we, we have to ask, are our grandchildren going to have a chance to grow up to be grandparents? And there you're only talking about, you know, seven, six generations. That's not much in the overall scheme of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the thrust there. But it's easy for um, it to seem like we're saying, I want to take this land away from you. And I don't really, I've spent a lot of time with all those people that are pushing these treaties. 
You know, the treaties with the Indian people where it says in the Constitution they're to be treated as the law of the land. And I feel that we go astray as American people from something very fundamental about the way our government was set up when we don't honor those treaties. And it's not a matter of taking something away from private people, really. If you really get into it, there are certain corporate structures that are designed really to maximize profits in a way that we, should, we could really examine because that's, that's where the push is to get at those resources and to get at the land. And I feel that uh, it's easy to make it seem like, oh, I want to take your home away from you. And there's a lot of anger and frustration and, 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 and pain on both sides. But the real fundamental issue, I think, is what, what is our communal relationship to the land? Thank you for your concern. Nice to hear it, Max. All right. His Thanks name for is letting me get that out. Oh, I'm glad you got it out. <laughs> it felt like it. <laughs> Max Gill is his name. He's a fine actor. Watch him here on Barney Miller and Whiz Kids. Stay tuned. 1011 Morning continues.